Welcome to Sky Fashion Hub 2020 from the Braylon Pavilion. Thank you for joining us. As we all know, global health precautions, quarantine measures and border closures continue to interrupt daily life. Times are uncertain and the world seems to have gone temporarily awry. At Sky, we're trying to take adversity in our stride and creatively problem solve. Over the coming months, Sky will broadcast a content-rich, for the most part Australia-focused, visually compelling virtual suite of conversations, all within the context of our usual hub format. Our cast of designers, makers, writers, authors, academics, theorists, gallerists, curators, museum leaders, activists and philanthropists are currently and progressively being filmed. We hope their wisdom and expertise will provide both inspiration and comfort to you at this trying time. Be well, be kind and above all, be safe. We're going to focus on costume and collaboration. And I'd like to begin by asking you both, and perhaps we, we start with Jennifer, to talk about the very early days uh, uh, in your life. What were the inspirations that set you on this path where you find yourself today? It was in the country. I went to Wagga, Wagga to do an art course and there was a theatre company down there and they needed somebody to come and do costumes. So. I just it happened to fall into it. Otherwise, I would have never had anything to do with theatre. It just it was I was there at the right place at the right time, <laughs> and that's how I started, really. And Suzanne, um, I also was always really interested in costume and fashion. I trained as a fashion designer um, at East Sydney Tech, now Sydney Institute, um, and then worked, became very quickly more interested in theatre and in telling stories um, using that medium of costume and fashion originally and worked as a designer for some time and then became just more interested in the collaborative aspects of designing. I was more interested in working with designers than being a designer and then began a career as a costume supervisor, working in theatre film events and eventually ended up at NIDA as the head of costume for many years. So I've, I've had a career that spanned a lot of things, but I've, I've come back to this idea of um, loving the collaborative act of co-creation that happens with costume design. And can I ask you if you both feel that your career has been fulfilling? Yes, and I, I don't think I would prefer to do anything else and I've, I've probably done the biggest job I'll ever do when I did the Olympics in mm. Sydney 2000. I, I would agree with that Jen. I, ex I often think what's the best job I've ever done and I think it's the Olympics in Sydney 2000 working with all of those people from transport, from film, from theatre, from education. It was, all together on one, yeah, one big was, massive job. It was amazing. Robin Arch has a lovely saying, art is not the frill on the frock of life. So I thought I might ask you both just briefly what you think you give to the world and give to people through your discipline. I've never worked in, in fashion and for me working in theatre mm. it is about working with people and building something together and putting on, on, on mm. stage and it's the adrenaline of opening night and the race to get it done mm. because you can't delay it. There are you know, they've sold tickets, the curtain goes up and it's a spontaneous thing and it's, it's working with people on a common, common show. Yeah, for me, for me it's, it's the race to get it on. I would agree that you're collectively imagining something into being through all your skills, whether they're, um, you know, the finest skills in rigging a light or hemming a garment right through to uh, stage management performance itself. Um, that it's this huge act of co-creation where you're imagining something into being at a certain time and place. Mm -hmm. And the thrill that comes with that, that it, it's always 
thrilling those last couple of days. And I think we're addicted to that mm. adrenaline as well. Yeah, and the result is more yeah. than the sum yeah. of the parts yeah. to create this mm. wonderful thing. We were initially um, going to start talking about opera, but it's a good place to start because it's the most flamboyant and the most extravagant of the art mm. forms, arguably. to say, or is it a bit provocative, to say it really is the costumes and the mm -hmm. sets that elevate opera to the status it has in our culture. The opera companies are probably more funded, so you can actually do a bigger job. Mm. I guess having a, a, a major company with mm. the right funding, you can be more extravagant. I spent a period working as the head of costume at Opera Australia and saw in those that time a lot of opera and I was struck by that moment when the curtain opens and the audience clap the set the set or the costumes and I thought wow we've we've done such a great job it looks amazing but I think gee theatre is so much more than just how it looks for theatre to work it has to be a combination of spectacle which opera does beautifully but also narrative it tells a story and ideology it's also about something that's bigger than itself so yeah, I was, I was always kind of uh, torn between being very happy when the audience clapped the, the spectacle, but also thinking, come on, there's more. Similarly with Bangara, I mean, sometimes the pictures, stage mm. pictures you make are so beautiful that they make you want to weep, but they're just a moment in a, a longer story. about movement and costume because it's one of the defining differences between couture and, and fashion or streetwear and the sort of garments that are designed for the stage. They have to be robust, they have to withstand a long season, they have to be practical, there are budgetary constraints but movement underpins all of that I think. That's where I came from. I, my first job with, was with Sydney Dance Company, my first professional job. And I've had a long association with dance. And that my point of view, I learnt through the making of dance costumes. So I think if you can design and make dance costumes, you can pretty well do anything because the movement is what's restricting and what the practicalities of what, what they can and can't do. And hopefully every costume needs to look exactly the same on stage every single performance, eight shows a week. It's partnering, it's trust. If, you, if you're designing costumes for dancers, you can destroy their career if they break, break a leg or a toe. Or, so it, you kind of got to look at it from a different perspective, whereas the Australian ballet is more of a character ballet. and Well, they're not as hard on the costumes, whereas Bangara, and I've worked with Bangara for the last 30 years, and a costume for them that they turn into their own kind of art piece and then they cover themselves with ochre. And, and I always take that into consideration when I'm 
designing something that I'm giving them kind of a skin that they layer up with ochre. They start with something and then they arrive at something else five mm. years down the track. And, but that would mm. never happen with the Australian Ballet. To totally different companies, different ways of approach. In that way, you're collaborating with the performers themselves, aren't you? With Bangara, they're a very floor-based company. So there's a lot of knee work, and whereas the Australian Ballet is always up. Mm. So it, you, you look at things from different perspectives. I observe the difference between um, putting a costume on an opera singer in terms of movement and a dancer is obviously, there's obvious huge differences. But opera singers often come with a very particular range of embodied perspectives, things they can't do, they won't do, they don't feel comfortable doing. Whereas my experience is with, with dancers, they'll be very happy to, you know, put this on or put a, well, try anything. Pretty well, yeah. are very yeah. happy to wear anything, anything. or nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and fabrics have evolved yeah. too, yeah. you know, with a lot of stretch and, and yeah. like there's a lot of what was available 10 or 20 yeah. years ago is completely different. It mm. is. I, I always found it interesting working in opera with opera singers in period things um, where there was a corset and some performers would love the corset really mm. tight mm. and they'd love to push against it mm. and, and sing, you use the muscles of their diaphragm against this corset and others just didn't want anything touching them at all. Mm. So you then would have to work with the designer to say, can we rejig this a little bit because this performer really cannot mm. perform and, with and after all, the, the performer has to be comfortable that's right. wearing what they're wearing. That's right, yes. In the it, it, that, that's the bottom line from, yeah. from yeah. feet to... Because if they're not performing, we're not doing our job either. Mm. So just a little bit on that note of stretchy fabrics and the change in fabrics over your career, the period of time you've been working, Jennifer. Can you talk a little bit about that? Has your job become easier or...? I think you can become more inventive because certainly with technology now you can laser cut, you can you can digitally print, you, like yeah. there's many possibilities. And certainly with Bangara, I use a lot of texture and a lot of layering and dyeing and stripping back. And the costumes that I do for Bangara are much more textural from a distance. Yeah. And it's what reads from a distance too. Yeah. And Suzanne, mm. you know, you've done a lot of teaching and you've been shaping people's careers uh, and dealing with a lot of young mm. people, mm. discovering this whole world. How does fabric work for them and this whole process of or just the materials of designing and um, how do they respond? Well, I think I've kind of seen big shifts in technology um, around what's available and what from just 3D printing of jewellery and accessories mm. and fixed fittings that you can put on things mm. through to digital printing, amazing uh, advances in that. What was not possible 20 years ago, although it was really d expensive and difficult, is now just a click of a finger. I remember Jenny and I did things for Centenary Federation um, where we were printing and digital, and it was amazing that you could take a photograph and digitally print it on um, stretch fabric. Now those things are really easy. So you can capture a design and keep reproducing it very easily, whereas previously it was much more difficult. Hand painted. I'm, oh, and, and I'm thinking about the tights for Phantom of the Opera or Love Never Dies, which was the f sequel to it, which every tight was originally hand painted with stripes. And then we realised that we could digitally print them and it was a revelation. <laughs> it's not about the technology and the technology doesn't lead us, but it gives us a bigger palette of possibilities. Um, to draw from, I think, and, and always I'm, uh, I position it that way, that it's not about the technology driving what's, what you can do, it's about your imagination and the technology mm. making that possible. That's right, there's yeah. nothing you yeah. can't do. And what you've touched on in that, that conversation is something that's very important in, in this panel, is your relationship with each other and your collaborative friendship. It's actually not that big an industry. No. It's a, um, a very small yeah, industry. it's a mm. fairly there's, small. There's only a certain amount of good supervisors that yeah. you want to work with, dance designers, yeah. opera designers, and it's not often that they cross over. I mean, I love working with Jenny because of she's a unique mix of technical ability 
um, that she's got a deep understanding of how to make costumes, but also a creative sensibility. That's reflected in her designs as well, that Jenny's designs go from quite detailed things through to sometimes it's just a sweep, you know, just mm. a, a movement. And then my job and the job of the team of makers that I'm working with is to translate that design into reality. And sometimes that's such a fulfilling creative experience when you're working with someone who understands what you're doing and is making offers and understanding your offers. And the, and the opposite of that is someone who doesn't understand anything about construction, yet can challenge you to problem solve. Mm. I mean, I, I'm thinking about a number of designers I've worked with who say, I just want it to sort of roll out of her sleeve and then become 10 metres long and then retract. And you're thinking, well, well, I can't see how that could happen. <laughs> and, and it's true. And when yeah. I do my drawings, I'm thinking about how I'm making it and what yeah. fabrics I'm using. And I can make anything I've ever designed. Mm. As an example, when I did Giselle in Korea and nobody spoke any English and having an understanding of how you could do the, some tech drawings at, with the cutters and the makers and really mm. put the lines and this, and you could, we had this understanding mm. of exactly what, but we, we couldn't, we didn't actually talk a word apart from going, you know, like, <laughs> We need it here and here and so it, it, it's really helpful to understand exactly how you make something. Can we just take the steps of um, the whole process of when you're asked to do a show, um, let's say you're doing this one together, what, what does that process look like? Well, you get an offer of a job, you say yes. <laughs> We have a lot of meetings with the artistic director or the choreographer and the set designer and the lighting designer and the sound composer designer. Mm. And we sit down and we really discuss the whole story. And then really I present drawings or mm. with Bangara or Contemporary Dance Company mm. that's creating steps as they go along. It's you, mm. I really need to sit back and wait till there's groupings and what they actually mm whether they're rolling on the floor or whether they need something to 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 use mm. fabric wise or whether there's kind of nets or hoops or or whether I'm giving them something to to make movement out of so it's very collaborative that we all work together and we're all on the same page because there's no point me going off and doing my own designs and then having them all made and then coming mm. in putting them on stage and mm. and it's has no relationship to the set or the choreography. Some companies, you're actually, like the Australian Ballet, you are designing the show before the choreographers, six months before, and they're made. And, and my role might come in around about there in terms of costing. Yes. That you're often asked, yeah, can you cost this now? And it's always, how long's a piece of string? Because we don't know what we don't know about how the production might evolve. I'll often come in and there's a sort of producers breathing down my neck saying, but how much is it? But how much is it? And I'm like, well, <laughs> we're only going to do it once, so I can't tell you how much it is per unit. So there becomes this iterative situation where we have a budget, we need to work within it. That becomes this iterative dance for a while, doesn't it, around how much does it cost, how much can, what yeah, can you do? Yeah, it's all budget driven yeah. in the end. In the end. Um, whereas something for me like Lion King, which I've worked on, that comes as a package, um, both in terms of what it costs, um, but also how it's done. Mm -hmm. So something like Jenny designed Dirty Dancing years ago, that's now the most successful musical theatre production ever. But there's a Bible which is, this is the costume, here's mm. a photo of... Sometimes for, for a contemporary show, you might have a range of options. Is that right? That there's, you know, this pink dress could look like this in San Francisco, in and Korea it's body, it looked and like it's this. body shapes too. So, yeah, you might yeah, have yeah, six yeah. dresses in the gazebo mm, that, mm. and you've got six dancers and you're mm. obviously going to swap them around mm. because they're, they're all colour, you know, yeah. colours on, on skin yeah, yeah. and depends. So there's Just a range. Just what suits somebody better. Mm. But for Lion King, it was... This, Absolutely this leaf steps. is Pantone 654 and that's what it is. Mm. And you get it made in San Francisco at this place. Yeah. Um, so our battle was to say, well, actually, we can do things here when we did the yeah. Australian production in, um, the, in 2003. So if you, let's say you have the lead mm. um, 
actor or actress or both, mm. and and you've got to um, devise the costumes on an on a new production, perhaps not one that's got the Bible and that that long legacy with it. Mm. Mm. Um, how do you proceed then? Well, mm. twirls of of the body shape. Madam Butterfly is exactly mm. that. You're mm. designing something. You think you've got one uh, one person mm. that's contracted, and you're making this something that would look fantastic on a size 10 or a mm. 12 and and it's somebody that turns up that's completely opposite to mm. that. Yep. Mm. Let's talk so, about Butterfly. You seem to have translated Butterfly from being uh, a, a victim who's not such an interesting interpretation, and, I don't think, and in your costumes, she's she's a heroine. Working with Graham Murphy and, and, and we really tried to go down the origami and the, and the you know, a lot of pleating and a lot of rope tying of all the, the like, she had a history before she was, she had that story. So it's, mm. it's mm. Graham as example, I do, a, we talk about it and I do a lot of referencing mm. and we kind of go, and he goes, oh, I love that, I love that. And then, okay, well, and you, sometimes you just find a really great image and then the whole, it shapes the whole yeah. show. It is sometimes finding that visual metaphor for, that informs everything, it informs even the maker's decisions, if you know what that visual metaphor is. So yeah, you, you've both done a lot of research in, in your careers. What do you look to for inspiration? Do you look to past productions or do you look? I mean, now, of course, mm. You can look at Pinterest, you can look at books, That's you can right. look at everything. And I, I take that as an advantage that went for, like, Mary Widow, that was Art Deco. I just bought lots and lots and lots of books and mm. just you, you find your favourite designers and then yeah. you look at all these fabulous shapes. Mm. And that was Art Deco mm. was such a fabulous period to do and that yeah. probably is one of the only period non-contemporary yeah. yeah works that I've ever done and with the set we decided well the first act was all going to be satin long dresses bias cut type mm. long dresses that sat in a black and white set and the second was going to be much more like Monet painting and all garden party and beautiful florals and and the last act was all gold and black set and velvets for the dresses so it was a great show to design. It's a, a dream period to design. Art Deco it was so decadent and fabrics were beautiful. And most women looked fabulous. Because I do a lot of ballet, I'm very much influenced by the way fabrics move. It's the most fantastic show to design because it's a three act play. The first act is all gold and black set and it's a cocktail party. The act one satin dresses, they were quite a heavy weight silk satin. Bias cut so we've got a lot of lines in different shapes with a bit of flair. Second act is garden party. The set is a Monet water lily painting. Having florals and softness in front of that is beautiful. Hannah's act two skirts were embroidered in India. All the, the women are in florals but her particular costume I'm based on an original movie of The Merry Widows. This is, belongs to one of the principal women and this one is hand painted and it's chiffon with handmade little flowers. And then, of course, the last set is uh, silver and, and black and, and mirrors and frosted colours, so we decided velvet. Every act is very different, but very beautiful. So I think whilst, whilst you might look to history and the history of design and style, um, certainly we say to our students not to look at past productions, because theatre should always be, or performance should always be, about now. We use the vocabulary of design and style from the past to tell contemporary stories. Can we just talk a little bit directly about Bangara too, because it's mm. an amazing collaboration mm. and indicates that there's a lot of And it's a, a great company to work for mm. because mm. Mm. anything's possible. They are presenting a story, but I'm, I'm not given a character. I'm, I'm given yeah. an idea, but it, it becomes an artwork costumes yes. for Bangara. Like, yeah. like terrain was, as an example, was about the land and there was salt pans and there was, there's duos and trios of people and I really was creating costumes that had, that were abstract. Mm. So you, you're trying to find 
textures that you can layer on mm. fabric and then strip it back and add and so it's visceral. <laughs> it's I can do stuff so much more creatively mm. for mm. them and mm. I make their costumes too because I yeah. well not all of them but mm. but I, I used to make all of them but I, I certainly pick the ones the hero kind of principal costumes that I want to make and mm. I create it as it goes along. And so how does that process develop when you when you're developing the costumes what sort of conversations would you have? Do you do you talk to the dancers or do you take advice more from the choreographer? It's, it it mm. is definitely the artistic director choreographer. They educate the dancers of stories of past stories. It's very unique in the fact that we sit down and, and we are all given information about cultural stories and the elders come in and they they give Bangara movement. And sometimes you go out to country, yes, don't you? You yeah. go to country and be in the place and that the story came from. And I would never do any of the traditional yeah. things. Like, yeah. I, I'm not about mm. recre recreating their traditional yeah. feather strings. I would, they would do it. We mm. might do abstract ones that, are, that don't, don't mm. touch that mm. cultural... To me, that seems an incredibly powerful point of collaboration between and cultures. I've been working and with them for 30 years and yeah. Stephen before Bangara because he was a dancer with Sydney Dance Company. Yeah. So there's long histories mm. of friendship. The ideal collaboration would be, what would well, you define Well, somebody that, that yeah. gives over because there's nothing worse than working with a director that wants to wants to almost make the costumes. Mm. Sometimes mm. that you do work with directors that have got so, they're so hands-on and specific that you, you, they want to control everything and actually mm. that's not the job. I think at that kind of early stage, at the early part of the creative process is a process of offer and acceptance, isn't it? That you're offering images and textures and ideas. Designers are nearly always visual thinkers. Mm. Yeah, they nearly always communicate primarily in mm. images. And often directors are more um, intellectual or heady. Often I'll hear from designers, I only know what they don't want. They just keep telling what they don't want. I don't know what they want. I don't know what they want. Um, so often it is this process of, of l almost learning another language. It's around designers listening to directors for what it is that is setting, is inspiring them and around directors looking. Often I'll be um, amazed that the design process is going along, going along, going along, everything's going great, and we get to the stage and you have directors going, uh, what's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> because they haven't seen it. Mm. And I'll often, as a supervisor, be very keen for the director to come to the costume fittings mm. to see, but on a big show that's really almost time. impossible. Mm. So that moment of, sorry, what's that, is, is often very tense. <laughs> um, and it, you can always track it back to this miscommunication around imagery, I think. It, it's <clears throat> all about distance, putting it on mm. stage under lights, because if you're showing them something, yeah. it reads completely differently yeah. under daylight mm. when no makeup, no, hair's not done. Yeah. And often there's this three-way communication between the director, the performer and the designer mm. that as a supervisor I've had to mediate in some way and ultimately it's the director who will get the final say in a decision but it's often around how you communicate what the problem is. But also, you know, ideally you'd have a designer in the rehearsal process all the time, watching things as they evolve because the rehearsal process, again, is organic and creative um, but the reality is you're very rarely able to spend more than a couple of hours a week in rehearsal. You're reliant on people like assistant directors and assistant stage managers mm. to do that translation for you. Let's talk about fabric because that's underpinning costume. Um, we've, we've talked a little bit about how you create your own fabrics. And let's talk about how light works on different fabrics. Mm, definitely. Because mm, um, lighting... Mm, lighting yeah, it, and, brings things to light. And if you've got shine or you want it to sparkle, mm, mm, or, mm, like it's... Lighting is very important. Mm. Sometimes I've done ballets where you might as well have not done anything and everyone should just bring a torch mm. because <laughs> you can't see a single thing. The care of the costumes mm. throughout a production Mm. They've got to look 
good on the night and look mm. as if uh, not like they've been on yeah. stage. <laughs> well, I think I think like performers and da dancers, singers, actors, every night they have to do exactly the same thing. They have yes. to reproduce the same performance every night. The lighting design has to be exactly the same every night. The costumes have to be exactly the same. And there's the work of performance workers is that. It, it, the design sets it, but there's a great deal of logistics and technology that goes into keeping that looking the same, particularly for a show that's running mm. for years or decades. Do you have a laundry mistress or master? Uh, it depends on the scale. Size of the company. If, if yeah. it's a large company like commercial musical theatre, you have what's called a head of wardrobe who will run a team of sometimes 30 people and there's a day team that comes in to repair and mm. fix the things that from the performance the night before mm. and then the dresses will come in for the night so you've got two crews running sometimes overlapping each other so there's communication or with a sydney or, dance company or bengari you've got one poor person that does the lot yeah or the design and the, or the performers and do it the themselves making, and the, what, yeah. you know, yeah. it just depends yeah. yeah for those large large musicals it's also about those costumes are a, a very expensive asset, mm. a very expensive asset mm. that needs to be cared for. I like to be in America, okay by me in America, everything free in America, for a small fee in America. Uh, when you design costumes, and, and probably you he would hear more feedback from those hero costumes, the principals in, mm. in the productions, what do they say when they put the costumes on? A variety of comments. If it's a drama piece, I've heard a lot of actors say, oh, now I've found my character. Mm. You know, that's, mm. I've found my character. But that's in a character-driven dramatic. The first dress rehearsal is the first time they've seen the yeah, costume. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, everything from... Because you're racing along trying to get it finished to get it on stage. So. Often, often they're more interested in um, w how the costumes function and what they wear when and when they have to change rather than what it looks like so much, I think. We've talked a little bit about, you know, dancers are much more accommodating of, of well, they'll just wear what they're mm. given. So is there, is there a hierarchy of um, temperament, perhaps, <laughs> in the performing arts <laughs> where you might find that in one particular art form the individuals like to assert or control over their look. Dramatic actors trained in like the method where they're completely embodying a character will come to fittings with a very, very, very um, defined idea of what they think they what should glasses be glasses and what <laughs> colours and what they yeah. think they should be wearing. So sometimes that's a very <laughs> tense conversation uh, because they're not thinking beyond their character. Exhausted and dispirited by the events around him, Stanislavski spent the summer of 1906 in Finland. He felt like giving up the theatre altogether. But he was about to make one of the important discoveries of his artistic life. Each morning, he walked by the seaside, recalling his career, his lessons and his mistakes. Once again, he saw before him his favourite actor. There was something they all had in common in their best moments. Perhaps this meant that inspiration has some laws of its own. If these laws exist, one can put them into a system. So that would be a uh, trickiest absolutely challenge? Absolutely true, and, and I think a costume designer in many ways has to be somebody that can convince somebody that mm. they actually look good. Mm. Opera singers can be mm. quite particular, as I was saying before, about how a costume feels more than how it looks. They're very used to wearing outlandish period costumes, <laughs> um, so they're less concerned with what it looks like than what they can do in it. And as we said before, my experience with dancers is that they're beautifully flexible in terms of what mm. they'll try, but Generally. they're also very responsible for, as you mm. said, what they can't do, that if they're going to slip in something or they can't do what they need to do, they'll tell you straight up. 
And they've been doing it since they were four years yeah. old too. Mm-hmm. Dancers have been, it, you know, they, they've been do, being told what, they're very disciplined and, yeah. and, and they're used to being told well, what to do. One thing too that I'm interested in is reflections on highlights and perhaps, you know, challenging productions that yeah. you've worked with. Um, I love doing The Lion King. It was a cross between, you know, I, I often say a cross between the most wonderful creative experience I've ever had as I was deputy costume supervisor for that. Massive scale, beautiful costumes, but also like putting in a new McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. it was, you know, mm. as I said, Pantone 486, that's that costume, this is how they all work. So it came to us as a package and it was um, around the logistics of trying to get all of that done. And it's massive um, with the resources that we have. Probably the biggest show that I've worked on was the Doha Asian Games, which was designed and made here in Australia um, and then transported across to Qatar um, for the opening ceremony in 2005-06. And in terms of budgeting, that was an incredibly huge budget. It, it took a lot of the, the same team as Sydney 2000 um, and some of the same tricks, some of the same aesthetics and recreated them with, I think, 10 times the budget. Um, light up costumes, we had everything mm. um, and a huge workroom and it was fun. But I've also had the highlights of my career have been working on really small, intimate stories where you're telling a story with a group of other people, you know, so, yeah. mm. that, which might be independent theatre scene. I guess the, the highlight in my career as an event mm. would mm. definitely be the Olympics because mm. I did one section in the opening ceremony and mm. I co-did all of the costumes for the closing ceremony and that was, well, everything was possible and it was mm. everybody working mm. together mm. on a huge scale. But then as an individual costume, it probably... Mm. Costume-wise, it's not my greatest work. It was just the whole sheer scale of it. Probably, I mean, we're doing operas is great mm. because mm. of the the support in the the company, the the size of the wardrobe department, and almost the bigger shows are easier because mm. you've got the support and the, and mm. there's the numbers, and you don't actually have to physically make anything mm. yourself. Probably the most creative works I've done in Bangara. Mm and they're much more sculptural. But of course, I started at Sydney Dance Company and I did a lot. I did 16 years of Sydney Dance Company, so, and that was very abstract, which is where I learned the trade, really. I'm reminded by what you were saying about the different costume departments that I haven't asked you directly about the relationship with you and the workroom, the people who are actually stitching. Mm. What's that like? You really need to um, admire your costume mm. department. If if you if they don't like you, <laughs> it could be mm. it could go terribly wrong, and, and it'll mm. be very hard for you. And also, mm. you're all working on the same job, trying to achieve the same thing. And mm. and they're very skilled at what they do, mm. and they can only only make the job easier for you. You need to respect their mm. their disciplines because <clears throat> they're enabling your mm. job mm. to look fantastic or not. And I think a costume workroom is a very unique place um, in this modern world in that it's a room often filled with very, very highly skilled people with skills that are 300 years old, you know, more. Glove making, millinery, um, corset wig making. making, wig making. It's, there's something very Victorian about the costume mm-hmm. department. But they're, they're primarily places where people are sitting fairly close to each other, talking. So mm-hmm. it, it, it's a much more social ecosystem than perhaps a scenery mm-hmm. workshop where people are more disparately mm-hmm. proportioned. Um, and costume departments can be heaven or hell, I mm. think. You know, they can and they're be... not necessarily working on the same yeah, show yeah, either. Yeah, there yeah, might yeah. be Merry yeah. Widow being built and mm. Traviata next... Yeah, uh, at, you in, know, at, in the Australian Opera, the same, for instance. They might have four or five yeah. shows on the go. Yeah, or, or you, and you're sampling another three. Mm. So every single person cares deeply about the quality of the work mm. or they're not there. Mm. You know? um, because you're talking about, certainly at opera and... 
at the high end, they are the best jobs you can have as a maker. Yeah. yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, it's wonderful to be an independent artist, but if you want to make, be a maker or a cutter in performance, that they're the best jobs and you don't get to those best mm -hmm. jobs and t unless you care deeply and have a deep appreciation of it as a work of art, mm -hmm. not just I'm a tailor, I'm making stuff. I mean, we have in our workrooms some of the best makers in the world, mm. I reckon, and you'd know that from mm. that perspective. I agree, I agree. And yeah. I think after the Olympics, yeah. Yeah. after yeah. anything was possible, and the film industry yeah. too, yeah. You know, it, yeah. amazing, amazing um, mm. technicians. Mm. But I, I, I do think there's a tradition of craftsmanship here that is quite extraordinary. Mm. Well, I think that's a yeah, really yeah. lovely place to, to end the conversation. I think the really interesting mm. words that have come up, mm. are, you know, the idea of an ecosystem mm. that, mm. that you've applied to various areas in, in mm. this world of design mm. and family mm. and the fact of um, mm. all of these productions are a collaborative process. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks Thank so you. much. Nice chat. <laughs>